talk about the follow-up to the chapter 17, which described the stellar or the, yeah, the stellar evolution of a low mass star and how it ends, right? And where we can locate each stage in the h &R diagram. As you can see here for a low mass star, uh, we discussed some of the processes in between, right? Uh, the helium flash, the horizontal branch, well, the subgiant first, and then the helium flash, the horizontal branch, and then the, the whole idea behind the planetary nebula and uh, white dwarf. Um, for a high mass, we didn't have many stages. It was more smooth, but the ending was more catastrophic, right? Because a high mass star, which we normally uh, consider at least uh, eight times more massive than the sun, will end up dying as a supernova, right? Um, one of the main differences, um, this one, one of the main difference is um, that a supernova, right, or the rate at which we can find supernovas in the universe and the rate at which we find main sequence stars like the sun, or at most, two times, three times more massive stars than the sun is much higher than the rate of the, than the probability of finding a supernova, even though those are very luminical events. And it has to do with the amount of stars that we find in this main sequence curve. As you remember from chapter 16, we said that more than 85% of stars are in this region right in the, we'll say in the low massive section, medium low massive. In the high massive, you have not many, right? So it makes sense that you uh, will see more stars uh, like the sun. So you end up seeing a lot of red giants. Uh, we have spotted or we have found a few white dwarfs in the, in the solar neighborhood or in, in the Milky Way, right? Um, but still, it's worth talking about the elements that are produced in the core of stars. In the case of uh, low massive stars, there were steps, right? You have hydrogen burning. Then when you get to helium burning, there is already a hydrogen shell burning due to the high temperatures and pressures, uh, which explains the expansion of the outer envelopes, right? and that helium is burning into carbon, but for the stars like the sun, we never see carbon burning. We could see or we see carbon burning with the stars that are two to three times more massive than the sun. But um, for the stars that are like the sun, the upper limit will be the red giant stage as the core is burning helium into carbon. Then the core collapses, the outer envelopes are ejected by the enormous pressure, right, of the shell burning that is happening uh, around the core, and the planetary nebula is formed by that ejection. Eventually, those uh, gases are expelled into the universe, and you are left with a core extremely hot, but very small, uh, cooling down for billions of years, right? So that's what we're going to be talking now in chapter 18, which is the graveyard in our universe um, here, right? Or the stellar graveyard, as it's called in the in the book. Um, hey, professor? Yeah. Are we? Is this going to be on the quiz next week, this no. chapter? No, no, no. Okay. The business week is only chapter 16 and 17. Okay, All right. Thank you. So this will be part of the test, though. So might as well start doing it now because we have a week for that, right? So two more classes. So the test will have chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19. 
19 talks about um, the Milky Way. So we're gonna start talking about the Milky Way. So that's the last test before the final. Um, okay, so there's a nice picture there, right? Um, what you can see there is like a planetary nebula, all right? And you see that bright dot in the middle, that's a white dwarf, right? Is the leftover core um, of a low massive star. And these are gases being expelled by the pressure. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of emission of hydrogen alpha lines. So that's why you have that reddish purplish color there. Um, so we know what's a white dwarf already. But we have to talk about what can happen in the cases of binary systems, where we have found quite a lot of these uh, objects. Uh, now, remember that we observe the universe in different wavelengths. So depending on the amount of energy right, emitted by the object, you may want to go into the X-ray and in some cases the gamma ray. Visible wavelengths are very limited, right? And we use infrared for star formation because of the amount of dust and the reddening. So that's good. UV light is still not very strong. So you wanna go beyond to actually see all the energy emitted. And the reason why, especially for binary systems, like for example, Sirius B, right? Is because what happens is that a lot of these white dwarfs tend to create or generate an accretion disk by sucking the gas of the companion. Now, let's remember that these white dwarfs are the remaining cores of dead stars. So as you remember, one important step in low massive stars is the idea of degenerated pressure by electrons is being squished together right and sort of break, uh, reaching the limit of the poly principle right that electrons cannot share the same stage right um so that's when the pressure becomes independent of temperature right so it's not thermal pressure anymore um this is a new stage of matter so this process happens before the helium flash, right? And then the helium flash happens, and then the temperature rises again to have thermal pressure taking over the generated pressure, and then you have the horizontal branch and all on. But with this, there is no more pressure being built, or there's no more fusion happening because the core is collapsing and shrinking. So again, you have electron degeneracy happening in the core and it's nothing is going to be able to stop it so basically what you have is electron degenerated matter left over in the core that is the main abundance or the composition sorry of a white dwarf okay and it has a very high temperature you can have supernovas in the 30 40000 kelvin and it makes sense right because remember those cores were burning at million kelvins. So it makes sense that even though they are cooling down in the very cold environment surrounding them in the universe, uh, the temperatures are going to still be very high. But because they're very small, right, you can have a white dwarf the size of the Earth. There. Um, then you could then that's why the luminosity is very, very, very small, very dim. Um, white dwarfs the same size as the sun, right? So you can have white dwarfs of different sizes based on the main sequence that form them, right? So a main sequence star like the sun is considered a low mass star, right? In the low end, you can have medium sizes. A medium size that also dies into a, into a white dwarf will be smaller. And this is very important. You may be thinking about, hey, wait a second. If they are bigger stars, why they don't make a bigger white dwarf? 
it all has to do with mass, gravity, and pressure. Um, we are going to learn today that very massive, extremely, like we're talking about 150 times more massive stars than the sun, will collapse into a supernova and they will end up having a neutron star, a pulsar, or a black hole. The higher the mass of the star, the most likely event of producing a singularity. What's a singularity? A singularity is basically what gave the origin to our universe and most likely other ones, by the way. So what we know is that all the matter of the universe was contained in a space smaller than an atom. And then it was expelled in the event that we call the Big Bang. That was a singularity, but a black hole is also a singularity. But we're not going to talk about black, black holes yet. Let's talk about a supernova. A supernova, the smaller it is, the more dense it is. Right? So the idea of a super, uh, supernova, the idea of a white dwarf being smaller than the size of the Earth, as you can see there, a uh, white dwarf, right? Means that it's going to be more dense because there was more mass. More mass of the main sequence star that died that collapsed in a very small volume. And what's density? Mass over volume. The more mass, the more density. The less mass, the less density. So then you have these two different objects, different objects, right? You have more mass, but it's so small that this object here on the right will be more dense than this. And subsequently, more dense than the Earth, of course. All right, so that's why, well, this is a review of last time, so we don't have to worry like you're in all this. That's why there has to be a limit for when a star can either produce a black hole or in this case to produce a white dwarf. There has to be a mass limit. If you go beyond that, it will collapse. And that limit is called a Chandra Sekar limit that we owe it to an Indian astrophysicist. He found it to be 1.4 times the mass of the sun. As the white dwarf approaches this, then the electrons will move almost at the speed of light. Uh, there is some math behind it, but if you remember, the kinetic energy was equal to the gravitational potential energy. And there is a factor of mass in there. Maybe some of you have heard about the Schwarzschild radius. So the Schwarzschild radius is the limit of the size of the event horizon of a black hole. That also has to do with this, by the way. All right. So is the point at, where this, at, what, at which the escape speed of an object will be equal to the speed of light. Remember in chapter four, we discussed about the escape speed of rockets. For example, in the case of the Earth, it's 11 kilometers per second. If they go beyond that, they can go out of orbit. Right? But if they go less than that, they will still be trapped orbiting around the Earth. So there has to be also a mass limit for a white dwarf. In this case, is this. Right? Because nothing can go faster than light. That's why. Okay? Uh, okay, so that's important there. All right? Um, so let's talk about density and binary systems. So what you see there is a main sequence star, or it could be a giant star, well, main sequence giant star, it could be like a blue star or a star like the net, a super giant star, that is being, part of its gas is being sucked into the white dwarf that you see there. I mean, it's not very clear, that's just an illustration, but what we want to highlight in this slide and in the next one is the accretion disk that is formed. That was one of the, I, I didn't study this in the in White Dwarf, but I did my, um, we, try, we investigated data coming from the black hole in the, at the galactic center in the Milky Way in our galaxy. And one of the reasons we studied it we keep studying it, by the way, is because we want to understand the physics of the creation, right? Um, so 
matter falls and produces that due to friction. And that friction emits a lot of radiation. That's why we use X-rays, because that radiation is very energetic. There's no way you can see this with visible light, right? You can probably see a glimpse of it, but to see really and to measure it, you need to have a higher uh, frequency. Um, but the thing is that that creation, the main difference is that it, because of the friction, it can heat up the white dwarf. And uh, remember, right? It's sort of like when we talk about the star formation, it gets to a point where the star, star the core of the star, gets ignited by burning hydrogen into helium. So most of the abundance in the in any object, in any stellar object in the universe, is hydrogen. So even though most of the matter is electron degenerated, electron degenerated matter, there's still some hydrogen there. And remember, it's sucking hydrogen from the star there. So that's going around the accretion disk, right? And eventually that can, that can get heat up to 10 million kelvins. If that happens, then you start getting fusion. But that fusion is not going to be like the fusion happening in the core of the stars. That's going to ignite a big explosion that we call it a nova. All right. Uh, so, well, I explained already what's an equation this, right? Uh, obviously, this is also due and is rotating by the conservation of angular momentum. So, angular momentum is transfer. Um, think, think, think about it as a merry-go-round, and you have kids in play in there. At some point, it's going to stop. But let's suppose you are pushing it. Or, stop, don't, don't think about pushing it. Let's suppose you come running, and you jump into the merry-go-round. You are transferring momentum like that. It's a typical problem in physics one, but that's sort of like the idea. All right? So that's what it means by transfer of momentum there. What would the gas in the accretion disk do if there were no friction? Because just like in a black hole, that gas eventually falls in, right? Which is uh, in the case of us, in the case of the white dwarf, it eventually heats up and well, the nova. So what would happen if there was no friction? Which doesn't make sense, but theoretically speaking, what will happen? Hypothetically speaking. Hmm. So if there's no friction, it wouldn't be B. Hmm. I'm kind of leaning towards C. Not 100% sure. It will be A. It will just orbit without friction, just ah, like, a satellite, a. Ah. like a satellite orbiting the Earth. Right? Without any force stopping it. Man. All right? The reason why a mass stops on the ground is because of friction, right? If you throw a mass or a ball or whatever. Imagine if you are in a thin layer of ice, and on top of that, you put uh, wax. It will not stop well. There's always some minimum friction, but you would see you see what I mean, right? It will not stop. It will keep going. Okay, so that's an illustration of a nova. The companion star, uh, which is mostly made of hydrogen, um, is being sucked by the white dwarf. You have the creation disk, and then because of friction, it falls, but eventually that will ignite the supernova, and will cook, and they will have, and you will have a, no a nova which is a very uh, lumin luminical event, which can be compared to a supernova, all right? In some cases, this is described in some textbooks as supernova type one, but it's not really. Even I, at some point, I remember I saw, I saw that um, that was, um, that could also be considered a supernova type one, but 
they make a, they make the difference in the astronomical uh, catalogs that when the explosion is due to hydrogen burning, you have a nova. Okay, and that makes sense, right? I mean, it will start to glow again. The supernova won't be destroyed, though. All right, it will be like a candle, like a spark, and then it turns off again. All right. So that's a picture there. Um, again, this is made at different wavelengths between X-ray and visible light. And you can see the Nova there in the middle outshining even the companion when this happens. Okay. Obviously, the Nova is an, in, is an event that doesn't last for a long time because since it's an explosion, it's ejecting gas and matter away from the Nova. So they basically everything that was uh, created by the, no, by the white dwarf is expelled. Uh, all right, what happens to a white dwarf when it uh, creates enough matter to reach the 1.4 times? So now we're talking about when it reaches that limit. Is it B? No, no, it cannot. Neutron stars, that's when you... Neutron stars, whenever you see neutron stars, pulsars, or black holes, you're talking about uh, high mass stars. Right now, we're still on low mass stars. Is it A? It's A. It explodes. Right? So it's like this, but... When the white dwarf reaches that limit, unfortunately for the white dwarf, it explodes and nothing is left over. That will be, that will be a supernova type one. All right. Because when it reaches that limit, it won't just burn hydrogen. Again, it will reach a limit in such a way that it will start burning carbon. And it's so energetic that the white dwarf won't be able to stabilize and it will explode and nothing else will be left. Right? Another sort of weird event. It's not, it doesn't really, we don't, we don't really see it much in the, in the universe. So when we talk about low massive stars, that's that. White dwarf binary systems with white dwarf companion, uh, white dwarf and main sequence companions or giant main sequences, and that's all. Um, oh, there it is. Um, let's talk about the two types of supernova. So now we're going to go into the interesting part, right? So what happens when a massive star supernova, when a massive star dies? In that case, that's when you have a supernova type 2. Okay? When the... And if you remember, let's go back to here in the evolution of a high mass star, you get all these elements. Well, this is more, this is better because it shows you the helium capture, but you get two iron and that's it, right? Iron doesn't give you any energy, so it will collapse, right? An iron-based uh, core. Depending on the mass of the star, right, it can collapse into a neutron star, right? That's it when it reaches that Chandra second limit, by the way. Uh, and by the way, when the neutron stars are formed, most of the times they, by conservation of momentum, angular momentum, they start spinning very rapidly in periods of milliseconds. Uh, that is called a pulsar, all right, which um, are basically neutron stars, right, that are emitting jets of radiation every certain, every certain period, every, every uh, at some given period, right, sort of like a lighthouse. 
in the case of a white dust supernova, is what I said. When you have carbon fusion, when it reaches the 1.4 times the, the mass of the sun limit, then you have this explosion and then nothing left of the white dwarf, okay? So these two events are very luminical, all right? Um, in terms of the scale, supernovas can outshine even galaxies when they actually happen and when we observe them. For example, the Crab Nebula that I show you, right? Um, but they are not very common. Now, um, they are not the most luminical events or most energetic explosions in the universe. We also have the gamma ray burst that you watch in the Dead Stars video. And if you remember, that event is quite dangerous. They are related to this. So the, normally you can have a, a, depending on the star, so depending on the star, uh, you can have high energy gamma rays being ejected from the core as the star dies into a supernova. Um, when this happens, you have one of what we believe the most luminical event after a Big Bang. And I talk, I, I said what we believe up until like a few, I would say almost a decade ago, more than a decade ago, because there is this whole theory of how black holes die, right? Um, either they collapse by what we know as the Hawking radiation, or there can be the collision or the merge of two black holes. And it's believed that the, the collision of two black holes could give you a much more luminical event. But we haven't seen one. And I think the reason is because when they collide, the space-time is broken and matter basically goes into one of them or basically just goes somewhere, right? Because of the space-time um, or how it wraps. Uh, but that's what we're going to talk about in a second. So in the case of the luminosity, here it is. So a white dwarf, a white dwarf supernova seems to be more luminical because of how it's produced, right? By that creation of matter and sudden burning of carbon. But it lasts for less than a year, as you can see there. It's nothing, astronomically speaking, that's nothing. Uh, massive star supernova, however, that will last a bit more. We'll talk about 100 days in average more. All right. Um, so that cube is also important. It just show it, it represents or it shows you the difference on luminosities between each supernova. Maybe that's also one of the reasons why we call supernova type one to the white dwarf supernova, which again is not the nova. The nova won't even come, well, maybe, but it will be less luminical than either of those, okay? And it's an event that lasts way less than that and is due to the um, companion, burn, uh, the white dwarf burning hydrogen in that case. Here is carbon. So supernovas, I said, are much more luminous. So it, you wouldn't even a uh, hundred times more, a hundred thousand, that's 10 to the seven, not 10 to the five. Yeah, you probably see around here. So yeah, it, won't, it wouldn't fit in this graph. It would be around here, like that, yeah. Right? Uh, the nova, again, is due to the hydrogen being reignited in the accretion. Uh, the white dwarf supernova that was in the graph there, the red, gra the red line, is due to carbon being reignited. And then you have the supernova type two, which is the explosion of a high massive star, right? Uh, so light curves differ, differ, so that's one of the differences between two supernovas, all right? Uh, oh, there it is, that's another interesting uh, fact. Remember that when we analyze light coming from any object, 
the best way to analyze it is by using a spectroscopy. So we can also, um, also I should say there's something that they miss here, the, flu the flux of neutrinos, that's something I remember I learned in um, stellar interiors. Uh, when a star is about to die into a supernova, I'm talking about a high massive star exploding, there is a large influx of, uh, of neutrinos, right? That indicates that the star is about to explode, all right? That doesn't happen with the wider supernovas. But as it says there, there's also the uh, absence of hydrogen lines in the white makes sense right because since a white dwarf supernova is about carbon being ignited all the hydrogen is basically uh i don't want to say absorbed but it's sort of like shadow by it right but in the high massive supernova uh, due to a high massive star all the layers are being ejected towards the universe into the universe sorry so you have a large amount of hydrogen that is going to be expelled during the supernova type two event. So you will see hydrogen absorption lines, which you don't see in the supernova type one. Okay. Yeah, we're about to get there. So now you know how, or what a white dwarf is basically. All right, what's the, is a, is the fifth state of matter, electron degenerate, electron degenerated matter. And what happens when a white dwarf is in a binary system? And now you know there are two types of supernovas. So there you go. You see all the things that you are learning between chapter 17 and 18, right? It's very informative chapters, by the way. So there, uh, as you will see in the, I think I'm gonna, I already made the assignment also. I will post that today as well. Let me just double check if I have it here. Because there is quite some questions I can ask. We might as well get you guys ready for that. Uh, chapter, yeah, here it is, 16 and 17, so, thing does it, no, that's a web project, right, where's the assignment, um, I think I posted already, but, no, sorry, that was the quiz, so the assignment, I will post it as well, but the quiz, yes, so the quiz, I have it here, but I have to be careful when I open it, um, let me just, I'm gonna make like a, no, there. Okay, so it has 17 questions, guys. And there are quite a lot of mix here, right? There's questions about um, protostars, questions about um, brown dwarfs, <laughs> questions about the lifetime of the sun, and then there are some pictures in there. There's a nature diagram. I hope that you guys study that slide about the pillars of creation that we start, we review in chapter 16. All right. So yeah, and then there is one. So there are 16 questions and one short ended question. All right. Where you have to explain something in there. All right. And obviously the exam, the last exam will have all this, right? So. Very important there. Um, okay, so now we are going into the objects produced after a supernova type two. So by the conservation of mass and energy, matter and energy are not are neither created nor destroyed, they are transferred. So even though a supernova is about an explosive event, right? Uh, matter is being either ejected towards the universe, but there are always a remnant in uh, or surrounding the area where the star used to be. So there is a limit. And again, we are gonna go back to the Chandra Sekar limit for this. Um, sure that. Uh, yeah, so depending on the size of the star, right, you may very well go beyond the Chandra second limit. But if you are within, then you will most likely have a neutron star. All right. So neutron stars are another stage of matter. 
Okay. Why dwarf were characterized by electron degenerated matter? Because electrons were stripped from the nuclei and they are like dancing around, moving randomly, and then uh, that 1.4 times the mass of the sun limit tells you that when they are about to reach the speed of light. However, there is a more, there's a, there are, in the case of a high massive star, that limit can be, uh, you can overpass that limit because there's more mass, but also because since we're talking about neutrons, you have to remember that an electron will more easily move at higher speeds because the mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to a negative 31 kilograms negative 31 huh? but the mass of the elect the mass of the neutron which is the elementary particle without any charge which is in the core or in the nucleus of the atom uh, it has about the same mass as the proton which is 1.67 times 10 to a negative 27. So it's four orders of magnitude higher than the mass, of, more, than four order, more than four orders of magnitude, more massive than the electron. So you need more mass to be able to make them move at higher speeds, like the electrons. So they need to be more dense, way more but they eventually reach that value and they are squished together, just the electrons, and you form neutron degenerated matter. That is your sixth state of matter. So degenerated pressure again, all right, uh, which is going against the gravity. So uh, that pressure is enough to hold the, the mass of the neutron star which is extremely big, by the way, right? Um, we're talking about objects that are probably the size of the Earth, but have the mass of, I would say, twice the mass of the Sun contained on the Earth, right? That would create a very, very dense. So by, which is the reason why they have an enormous amount of gravity. The more mass, the more gravity right? But these guys also tend to form in pairs. For, because remember, right, um, stars are normally found in clusters. So we normally we find, uh, we find clusters of stars, either open or closed. Um, so chances are that one or more or two or more uh, neutron stars can be formed when massive stars are dying into supernovas. And that was one of the key aspects to understand gravitational waves. Um, when Albert Einstein uh, reintroduced the whole idea of gravity as the bend of space-time that we are about to talk in a second, all right, one of the predictions that he made to astronomy, besides the expansion of the universe that he rejected at the beginning, and besides black holes that he technically didn't introduce, but they are a subsequence of his equations and the Big Bang as well, by the way, right? Uh, one of the consequences, right? One of the results was the fact that when very massive objects are orbiting each other, like in the case of two neutron stars, they do not orbit, they do not orbit themselves eternally because of the high amount of mass and pressure and density, there is an enormous exchange of energy in the form of gravitational waves. And that energy, because it dissipates, makes the neutron stars eventually get closer and closer together until they merge into another big explosion, by the way, right? Um, that actually, has been discovered already. We discovered gravitational waves in the year 2014, so seven years ago. Um, so there it is, right? Electron generated pressure goes away because electrons combine with protons. 
neutrons collapse to a center forming a neutron star. So electron, the energy pressure can go away. Neutrons, when they collapse, that's it, right? You start getting that they generated matter and they form that neutron, neutron star, all right? Another characteristic of this is the high amount or the very high, very large magnetic fields surrounding it. So in combination of the enormous magnetic field surrounding a neutron star, if these guys start rotating, then you will start getting a, you can start, you start getting this pulse of radiation, right? Um, and as you can see, the period can be smaller in some cases in the order of milliseconds. And uh, these pulses, right, indicate the presence of what? Well, in the case of the Crab Nebula, we can see that we have found that, look at the period there, right? We can see the presence of a pulsar, all right? which is just a very fast rotating neutron star. Okay, look at the enormous magnetic field there. All this, uh, it looks like a pipe, is a very a large amount of magnetic. So eventually the magnetic field gets concentrated and then energy is being ejected there, like that. All right, because the magnetic field will induce um, or will actually, yeah, will actually induce some large amount of energy here and that energy has to, that energy has to go somewhere right so there you are sort of like the radio jets that we that we, they were talking about like when you guys again if you guys watch the video that starts then you understand why this happens right these magnetic fields right with the high energy particles that are in the surroundings right will eventually be exp expelled like this Right. So again, to observe these things, we need to use either X-rays or gamma ray wavelengths, right? Um, to study them. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far, by the way? No. Nope. Um, when astronomers started the SETI program, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, it was very likely to confuse signals of civilizations with this because one of the key aspects or one of the rule of thumbs back then, right? We're talking about the 70s, the 80s, was to have a pattern, right? Um, before we discovered these guys, of course, uh, we knew that stars are radiating energy, but there's no pattern to the solar flares or the ejection of matter. They happen randomly. But when they saw this, they, well, they saw that it could be a pattern created by an artificial intelligence. Nothing far from that, right? Actually, it is. Disappointing, kind of, but amazing at the same time because nature can surprise you, right? Uh, nowadays, we're more straight uh, in terms of what we should expect from a higher intelligence, right, if we ever find one. Um, but there you are. There's another illustration there. Okay. Uh, again, these beams are due to the very high rotation. Now, look at the comparison there, right? So there it is. That's your lighthouse and that's your pulsar there. All right. And there's an explanation, mathematically speaking, on why they need to be neutron stars. It has to do with the size of the neutron star. Look, look at the size of a neutron star, 60 kilometers, right? We're talking about a radius of 10 kilometers. It's two pi is almost six, right? So, yeah. So we're talking about 10 kilometers. So what's the radius of the earth? 6,400 kilometers. So we're talking about a much more massive object than the Earth, contained in 10 kilometer radius. That creates a ultra, a very dense ultra, a very dense object in the universe. Oops. Uh, the spin rate can be about a thousand cycles per second. So you divide this by a thousand, it gives you milliseconds in terms of the period, right? Um, 
Now, if you multiply that by the radius, you start getting what? 60,000 kilometers per second, the surface velocity, right? Which is approximately 20% the speed of light, all right? That is actually the scale velocity for a neutron star, by the way. All right. Um, so that's the, some of the math behind it. That's, the, that's not a period. That would be the frequency, okay? The period would be the inverse of this. Uh, the size of the circumference of the radius is 10 kilometers. It can be a bit more, but it depends on the mass. And the scale velocity there. Just for reference, the scale velocity for the Earth was 11 kilometers per second, right? And for Jupiter, it's 22, 22, 23 kilometers per second. Just imagine that. Uh, what do you think? I just said that. Mm. Could there be neutron stars that appear as pulsars? To other civilizations, though, not to us. Yes. Because remember, it depends on how you are facing this. If you are looking at the pulsar face on, you will see the pulses. If you are facing it from an angle perpendicular to the disk here, you won't see this. So that's why. That's another picture. Again, look at the wavelength, X-ray intensity per second. So what we see, right, in a binary system, again, is that the intensity can increase all of a sudden and then decrease. Again, that's when the neutron star is in a closed binary system, which I just explained, right? Again, if you are having, say, not two neutron stars, but just like, just like the white dwarf, a companion like that. You all, and it, this will happen even more easily because the neutron star is much more dense than the white dwarf. So it will suck gas by its gravity more rapidly. All right? So then the intensity will increase. Talk about the radiation, which comes from the accretion. All right? A creating mass adds angular momentum. Angular momentum is proportional to the mass. More mass, more momentum. All right. Angular momentum was moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Right? Uh, so the moment of inertia is proportional to the mass. So more mass, more moment of inertia, more angular momentum. According to the conservation of angular momentum, what will happen if a star orbiting in a direction? Ah, what do you think about that? What happens if a star orbiting in a direction opposite to the neutron star rotation fell into it? So now here is when they are both going at the same right direction. But let's suppose the star is here now and it goes against. What will happen to that rotation? Huh? Would they both slow down? No, you're talking about the neutron star, right? Yeah, it will slow down. So B. The neutron rotation will slow down. Yes. Okay. 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 And again, in order to measure that creation, we have to use X-rays. Um. Okay. Let me tell you. And, something that we discover about the accretion. And even though this is black holes, it also applies to this. Um, what we discovered is that there is a lot of elementary particles in that accretion disk, mostly electrons, high energy electrons. And those electrons are not just by themselves. They are colliding one with, 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 with one each other, right? So what we discovered about that, and what makes this complicated is that X-ray radiation tends to outshine 
other types of radiation. So something that we discovered is that we might very well get um, radiation in other wavelengths. And I remember we were trying to get it in the millimeter, submillimeter, and even in the, um, was it UV or, or even in the infrared? But one of the problems is that it was impossible to see it. And maybe because what we think is happening is something called the inverse, com inverse Compton effect. So the Compton effect in quantum physics is that you have X-rays and then the X-ray pushes an electron right, because hey, energy has momentum, right? And that will make the electron gain some energy and that's what we observe. <laughs> but we, what we know is that those electrons in that creation there are already moving really fast. So what we think happens is that those electrons, right, can collide with infrared radiation and they make that radiation skyrocket to X-rays. And that's what we see. Um, it's something that uh, it's there. If you guys ever get interested in like uh, black holes or even neutron stars and stuff like that, there are so many papers that talk about that um, because that is one of the key features about these very dense objects is how they create matter. And you're probably wondering, but what's so, why do we care so much about that? Because here guys, we're looking at the limits or boundaries of Einsteinian physics. Everything that we have studied so far can be, remember when we talk about planets, satellites, I said, Newton's laws, good, you can do that. Well, you cannot apply them here. To study neutron stars, to study the creation of this, to study pulsars, you are talking about very dense objects. We are talking about very high speeds. So Newton's laws sort of start to break in there. And they start to break because um, you are talking about enormous speeds. Elementary particles going at very high speeds. And what we know from special relativity is that when objects are approaching, approaching the speed of light, there is this whole concept of time dilation and length contraction. Let me show you what that is. So what we think is that, um, or what Einstein introduced was this. So there is a constant or a factor, sorry, which is one over the square root of one minus the velocity of the object square over the speed of light, square. So a car, a planet, a rocket, a shuttle, uh, a comet, this fraction will be zero. So the gamma factor is one. So nothing happens. You can use Newton's laws. But if this guy is half this, this doesn't become zero. And this doesn't, is not, is not one anymore. This can be two. This can be 2.5, 2 only can be, or depending, if this gets very close to, to the speed of light, this will be very large. And what Einstein introduced was that, for example, the momentum, the relativistic momentum is proportional to this gamma factor. And also the energy. The energy is also this. And also, well, basically the mass is changing. Also time, the twin paradox. You have one twin here on earth, two twins on earth. One decides to go at the speed of light, almost, almost the speed of light, to Alpha Centauri and come back. This twin will be younger than his other twin by oh, easily 20 years. Have you heard about that before or not? You probably have heard about that, right? Yes. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Interstellar. So, oh yeah, interstellar. Yeah, let's explain interstellar. When they were orbiting the Tarantula black hole, right? Um, yeah. Sorry. 
Yeah, true. Uh, uh, Gargantua. Gar- Garganto Black, right? And then, uh, um, Matthew McConaughey. One, one day in the planet was almost 20, uh, what was it? 52 years. Was like 50, yeah. He was like, old, he was at some point older than his daughter. That's because of time dilation. But this time dilation is different. Yeah. Because this time dilation is due to gravity, which yes, that's the general relativity. The time dilation that I told you about traveling is the one due to uh, different of speeds. So when you go at very high speeds, your frame of reference for time is different than if you are not moving. So time goes more slowly. Hence, you are younger than your brother. Right? So for you, it's been like 10 years because Alpha Centauri is around 4.5 light years, so almost 10 years. For your brother, maybe it was 30 years. Right? Um, so that's what happens in this at this point when we start when we start talking about these objects because of the very high escape velocities, right? Here we're talking about twenty percent of your life. We're not at the singularity yet, though. Okay, so we are right now within the Chandra second limit. So at some point you get a neutron star, right? A high massive a high massive star dies. There is enough degenerated pressure to sustain gravity and you have a neutron star or a pulsar. If you go beyond that limit, in the case of a white dwarf, it exploded, right? In the case of a, of the remnant of a supernova, this is what happens. So what happens is that space-time is bent so much that you create something called an event horizon. What is the event horizon? It's basically what you see here. It is the limit at which light can escape. If you go beyond the event horizon, light will do this. It will go inside and it will never, never escape until it goes to the singularity which is here. The singularity is the center of a black hole, which from this point onwards, unfortunately, I can just tell you what Stephen Hawking and other scientists think based on some of the higher order theories and quantum physics. Einstein mechanics can explain you up until this point. Beyond that point is an obscure part of physics. Why? Because a singularity is a point of almost, almost infinite density. That's a symbol of density, by the way. Where there is an enormous amount of mass contained in a very, very almost zero amount of volume of space. So this will basically be another state of matter, but not really. What we think is that the universe has four dimensions, right? Space and time. So what you're seeing here is space and then time. What we think, one of the theories or hypotheses actually, is that here you are basically having another dimension. We call it this the fifth dimension. And the fifth dimension, I wanna explain you right now why. Um, one question, if I give you two dots, what's the shortest length between these two dots? If I wanna go from point A to point B, what do you do? Straight. Straight line, right? Yeah. Straight diagonal line, you all. Uh, okay. Let me show you. I want to turn on my camera. I want to use this piece of paper. Okay. So I want everybody to see me. Okay. Ah, my arm really is starting to hurt. So 
You're gonna have. Wait, can you see me there? Mm -hmm. oh, no. Okay. So you have uh, a space and time here, right? Like that. And I'm gonna draw two points here. And if you can see the uh, there, you see those two points? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what a black hole does is it can join instantaneously those two points by doing this. And this is the space. And then you create a kind of like a tunnel. We call that a bridge, the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which will join those two points like this. Right? So that you can go from one point of the universe to another instantaneously, which is why some astrophysicists say that that will be the fifth dimension, because you are going beyond time. How can I do that? It does that because of the way matter, or sorry, the way space has been bent. Look at the slide now, right? Um, now, we don't know that yet because we have never been inside a black hole. There's this whole idea about the information. Where does the information goes when you fall into a black hole? Um, in the 60s, a nice scientist called Stephen Hawking would have told you that that, that information is lost. But just like scientists, we do, we can be mistaken. And he, in his book, and I have the book here, I'm gonna see if I can bring it so you guys can see which one is it. Uh, what is but it? can it really be lost if matter- It cannot be lost. Yeah. Right, it cannot be lost. But where is it though? So one idea will be this einstein rosen bridge. Um, if you read on the bibliography, right, there's this whole concept of other dimensions, other universes, or just the whole idea yeah. of a white hole that connects two points of the universe, right? You go from one point of our galaxy to another point in another galaxy. This has been taken by comics, by movies, by science fiction and you can read it and they always take that as the only way to travel. The only movie that doesn't do that is Star Wars and Star Trek, right? They talk about the speed of light, but every other movie, every other book that you can read, they take this idea. The best example is Interstellar. In Interstellar, they talk about a um, einstein rosen bridge, right? which is a wormhole, which will connect two different points of the universe instantaneously. So it just kind of spits it back out somewhere else? Yeah, but we don't know that yet, right? We have never seen a white hole. I mean, we don't know. One, of the, where one we... of the reasons why this might be is because the amount of energy you need for this is so much that even if these guys are happening, they will automatically vanish. They will not be able to be sustained. So the black hole would just absorb it? Uh, yeah. Some part of it? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, okay. Be careful with this sentence, right? It's not that light cannot escape it, although it's partially right. The reason why light cannot, in, quote, in quotes, escape it is because light only travels in one direction. So light travels around the space bent by this uh, black hole, all right? So imagine, um, this is like a funnel, right? Upside down. So if you drop a, a piece of, a ball in here, right? It will just go all around it until it reaches this point. Now, how can we explain? What are the physics, what are the, some of the physics behind this, right? Uh, the escape velocity. 
which is given by the Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius is the radius of the event horizon. How do we get that? You remember the escape velocity was the square root of G M over the radius, right? One, oh, sorry, forgot about a factor there. Uh, two G M over that. If the speed of, if the, if the escape velocity becomes the speed of light, then this becomes the Schwarzschild radius. And you can find different ones depending on each object. For example, you can find the Schwarzschild radius for the sun, the point where light won't be able to escape. You, take, put, you put here the mass of the sun, you use the, the constant that we know, and then you put here the speed of light three times n to the eight, and you can find this, right? So that's here. What happens to the escape velocity from an object if you shrink it? So if we shrink the sun, but we don't change the mass, what will happen to the escape velocity? What will happen is that it will increase, all right? The higher the mass, the higher the density. And the lower the volume, the higher the density, the higher the escape velocity. And here it is. How do we do that? We equate kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy. And that's how we get 2 gm over the radius, the square root, that's the escape velocity. All right. Now, there's this whole idea also that black holes can also be taken as time machines. Because since you are going faster than light, you technically are going backwards in time. Again, this has taken by the science fiction, right? When they, and now we can talk about the Gargantua black hole, right? When they were stuck in that planet and they lost 50 years, right? Uh, they recovered those by going into the black hole, right? And since they are going into the black hole, and that's when he sort of sacrificed himself and then he dropped himself into the black hole, right? Uh, the whole idea behind that was that you will go beyond time and you can go backwards in time, right? Uh, so you will need much more energy than the simple plutonium. <laughs> Just to quote uh, Michio Kaku that they use in uh, Back to the Future, right? Um, okay. So the surface of a black hole is surrounded by an accretion disk, very, very energetic. It ha is characterized by very strong magnetic fields. It's characterized by that event horizon, and it has a radius called the Schwarzschild radius. All right. Um, now, a black hole by itself is just that. It's not the same as talking about a wormhole. When you guys read about wormholes, that's the explanation I made with this piece of paper. Think it as two black holes sort of connecting to each with each other. This is where the whole idea of the extra dimensions come from. We cannot use Einstein physics to study black holes, unfortunately, because if we are talking about singularities, uh, physics is divided in two branches currently. You have the physics that study galaxies, the universe, uh, falling objects, planets, we call that Einsteinian physics or relativity, Newton's laws, Kepler, all that. But there's another branch that was discovered and has been studied since last century, which is quantum mechanics. And you have Niels Bohr, Schrodinger, Feynman, and well, current scientists, right? Pauli, Heisenberg. So they all studied uh, the physics of particles. Now, believe it or not, Einstein was one of the first contributors. In fact, the Nobel Prize that Einstein has 
was due to the photoelectric effect, which is a uh, study of quantum physics. But unfortunately, he disliked the idea of probability. Quantum mechanics is all governed by probabilities, right? Electron cloud probability, perturbation theory, and a whole, like the wave equation that we discussed sometimes uh, at the beginning of modern physics. So he took himself aside from that. But, and if you know some history, right? You know that Einstein did that to kind of unify physics into one, but you cannot unify it if you do not have an understanding of quantum physics. And we cannot do that yet. An example would be gravity. Everything that we have studied so far has to do with gravity. But when we study the nuclear, the core of the stars, remember when we study um, star formation, the shrinking of the core, pressure, uh, nuclear physics, all that is what? Column law, which is electromagnetic radiation, uh, nuclear forces, but where is gravity, right? Gravity appears in a macro view, but when you talk about protons, hydrogen nuclei, there's no gravity. So there is no way to combine gravity with the other forces. And we know that at the beginning, when the Big Bang happened, they were all one super force. We call them the four fundamental forces of nature, right? They were joined into one. So gravity cannot be combined with the other free forces. One of the reasons is also because every force has a fundamental particle, right? You have photons, bosons, gluons for the other forces. Where is a, where is a particle for gravity? There is a theoretical one, graviton, right? And if you know about the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, one of the reasons we built it is to discover the graviton. Now, some string theorists will tell you, well, we cannot discover it because the graviton travels in different dimensions. So that's where other theories of physics start coming from, right? With the whole idea that to understand the universe, we cannot just talk about particles, we have to talk about strings and that they vibrate and oscillate at different frequencies, and they are the properties of particles. But we haven't found strings. We haven't found another uh, result that they, predict, that they predicted, which is supersymmetry. And we haven't found the graviton. Do we have enough technology? Maybe not. But we, we might have to go the other way around to find it. However, uh, the whole idea of extra dimension is still something that many physicists um, take very seriously because it will explain sort of the motion of subatomic particles. The fact that subatomic particles do not move just in four dimensions. They may move in higher dimensions that we cannot observe. Let's talk about gravity a little bit. And I wanna leave it like that. I wanna continue with this. Next class, right? We will start with a black hole. We go back from there. All right, we're about to finish anyway. Um, there is a video that I posted um, not so long ago that explained this. If you have different masses, let's suppose you have a mass and you have your bed here. A mass will make your bed bend, right? But the higher the mass, the more the bend will be. The curvature of space-time becomes so great in the case of a black hole that you produce a singularity. And that's key to talk about singularity, by the way. Because there are two singularities that we in astronomy talk all the time. One is the singularity created due to black holes. One is the Big Bang. The Big Bang also was a singularity. And you know who was the scientist responsible to come to relate one to with one with the other? Was Stephen Hawking. I always say that he deserved at least two Nobel Prizes, but anyway, uh, because he also discovered was the reason why black holes are not eternal, which is the reason which is what we know as Hawking radiation, right? Hawking radiation, in very short words, predicts that black holes eventually evaporate. It takes billions, maybe trillions of years, but they evaporate they lose mass, right? 
um, very, very slowly, but they lose it. Okay. Um, so that's something that he also discovered, which is why uh, people, uh, when we were like, um, when we were like about to turn on the LHC, we're talking about when? Uh, 2009, 2010. People were very scared about that. And many scientists said, well, can we create micro black holes in the LHC? Maybe. But what we know is that due to Hawking radiation, right, those black holes will be created and evaporated instantaneously. Right? Now, granted, we have never really seen Hawking radiation, but we know it's there, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of physics in there. I'm just giving you the surface of it. Uh, if you want to go into the study of gravity, guys, I hope that you remember this video. In this video, he does a demonstration of how gravity works, right? It's not a force as we, as it was described by Albert Einstein, as uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac Newton, right? Um, it's actually the bend of space-time, as you see there, right? And this explains the orbits of planets and the high and the theory, at some point he puts a larger mass in there, right? So this shows you also the very high eccentricity that we have seen. For example, uh, just to finish now, how do we know black holes exist? Because they, are, they don't radiate any light, right? Now we can study them in X-ray radiation, but back when they were predicted, right? Uh, we never really seen them, right? Well, we have actually. Let me show you the video that we have, because the best black hole to study is the one in the center of our galaxy, a supermassive black hole anyway. Um, Maybe this one. There it is. Uh, no, that's not this one. So, with NASA, in a period of 10 years approximately, we were able to. Oh, here it is. Let's stop this for a bit. From 1995 to 2002, sort of like that, we got this video. It's a contribution of several years, by the way. So there are some stars orbiting the center of our galaxy there. So when you zoom in, look what happens. This is star here and this one here. Look at this points. It is slingshots in here around nothing. What's there? There's a black hole in there. When you calculate the mass of the black hole based on this period and the distance that you have in there, 10 light days. It's not even an A. When we're talking about a use, talking about 10 light days. We get uh, around 2 million times the mass of the sun, an object in there. That's a supermassive black hole in there, all right? So that's an evidence of a black hole um, in, a, in the center of our galaxy. That's one of them, right? Um, now we have X-ray radiation from the creation and you know now you know the event horizon, this picture here. That picture there. I think you guys should probably watch one day one of these videos in here. Uh, this was done by several radio telescopes around the world. And maybe this one has a better picture. You know what this picture was amazing? Because this picture show a black hole almost identical as how Stephen Hawking predicted it. The yeah, creation in there, the black hole in there, the event horizon. It's amazing. All right. Um, anyway, do you have any questions? Um, just one to clarify: is the the event horizon the, I guess, top or entrance to the black hole, or is it the 
um, assumed bottom or not, there's not no, no, the bottom will be the singularity, the center of it. Okay. The event horizon is on the top here. Okay. All right. All right. We'll be surrounded by the creation happening in there, of course, the creation yeah. risk. So maybe it's in the, the picture. The singularity, right? Huh? It's the singularity? The singularity will be at the center there. Okay. That we have in reach. We can just sort of predict, right? So it will be sort of like this as well. So this could be like a black hole sucking also a star into it, all right? And you have a creation and there you have, so this is radiation coming, not from the black hole per se, but from the matter in falling onto this object. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about more space and time next class, all right? And why in some uh, books and also why some physicists we think that maybe